Thanks for listening to this Ed Influence podcast from Brown Jacobson, designed to provide insight to strategic leaders in education. Make sure you subscribe to the Ed Influence podcast so you're always accessing the insights and beliefs of people who are truly invested in shaping the education space right now. For more information on Brown Jacobson and our leading education practice, visit brownjacobson.com or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Ed Influence podcast series. Uh, my name is Mark, Mark Bloir. I'm the head of education at Brown Jacobson. And I'm really delighted to be here today with Sir Steve Lancashire, the CEO of the Reach2 Academy Trust. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased you're here, Steve. It's very, very interested to have a chat with you about the Reach2 Academy Trust, a very well-known trust, system leader trust, in fact, within the education sector and I think with, with around 60 primary academies now within within the trust and the largest primary only mat within the country. Um, what, what I'd like to do really if, if, if I may Steve is just just to go back into the annals of time and back to I think 2012 when when the trust was originally founded um, and begin the story there. Um, so I think I'm right in saying you were a head teacher executive head teacher at Hillyfield uh, primary in Walsham Forest, and that's where it all began. But how did the idea begin for for Reach Two as it is today? Yeah, so it, it did start. Um, the, my background is a, as a head teacher um, of twenty years, um, and was head teacher of Hillyfield, which is in uh, East London, Walsham Forest, um, and that was a school that had got lots and lots of challenges. Served a very very deprived community, which is all the schools where I've um, I've been a leader have been a, the same, mm. um, and was in special measures when I started there. It was my it was my third headship, um, and we had a very very um, quick journey from special measures to outstanding in three years. Um, and I developed there a, a school improvement model that, that I felt was really effective, really effective in not only. Um, obviously developing the quality of the education within the school, but also meeting the needs of quite a challenging and, uh, uh, and diverse community. Um, at that time, I became a, a national leader of education and the school became a national support school. Um, and we started a whole load of school improvement work outside of our own school. So that was not only within the local authority, Waltham Forest itself, uh, but through the National College, started to work all over the country. Um, and that gave me a real appetite for school-to-school -school support, for collaboration between schools. Um, and it coincided, of course, with, uh, uh, with a change in the sector where um, schools could become academies, um, could become independent from local authority control. Um, and Hillyfield was one of the very first um, primary academies in the country to convert. Right. Um, on the basis of that, um, the DFE came knocking on the door um, and said, you've got a, a really good track record in working with schools, supporting schools. How about becoming an academy sponsor? Um, okay. And because it very much um, fitted with what we've been doing for the last two or three years, mm. decided that it was a good thing. Uh, that they wanted to do more of it. Um, and I started to think about what a primary only multi-academy trust might look like. Um, right. and and so it was always originally, it was originally it was always seen that it was going to be a primary only trust. Absolutely, primary is my background, mm. it's my passion, it's my expertise. Um, and whilst we work very hard at transition and relationships with secondary schools, I knew that uh, you know the DNA for us is in, is in primary education. And that's what we're passionate about. So really, from the very very start, all was very clear that we were going to be a primary only match. Okay, that's um, interesting, interesting. And I think you talked about you talked there about the school improvement work that, that, that you, you were doing at, at Hillyfield Primary. And I think I'm right in understanding that the, 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 the approach that Reach 2 takes to school improvement is based on the national support school model. Is, 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 that, is that right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. There, there are certain key characteristics you know, of, a, of a national support school, um, and it's really focusing on those things, um, based largely on school improvement through collaboration, mm -hmm. through finding the expertise that exists within schools and releasing the capacity, the potential, um, and really working very, very closely um, between perhaps stronger and weaker schools for a time, um, and really capitalising on, on the capacity and expertise that exists between schools. And I think I'm also right in saying that in terms of the mission as it developed for the Reach 2 Trust, it was very much about helping struggling schools uh, and, and with a view to working or bringing outstanding education to pupils from from disadvantaged or deprived communities. That, it was that, that was always part of the... That was always the well. raison d'etre for, for Reach 2. My own background has been headships in, in, in serving very mm. challenging, diverse, um, 
socioeconomically challenged communities mm -hmm. um, and it's what I'm really passionate about um, and I think we've developed a model that works there um, and I think we're probably quite unique as a, a large multi-academy trust in that um, all of our academies are in, in socially deprived areas. Um, all of them, apart from four out of the 60, have been sponsored academies, which really? means that um, they were either below floor targets, they were uh, in special measures yeah. or, or mm. deemed failing schools. Mm. So um, uh, we started um, the, the trust only um, three converters since then as well. So it's still a, a trust made up of you know, schools that were failing. Right, okay. That, 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 that's, that's an incredible number, isn't it, in terms of sponsored? It is, um, and it's, uh, it's a good start. It, it, it's, a good, it's a good metric for us. When, uh -huh. we, when we started, 16% of all our schools were, were good or better. Right. Um, and as of uh, this term, it's now 86%. Wow. So um, it's not 100 yet. We've got a, we've got a way to okay. go. Um, but it's a, it, you a know, real, it's, it's a real you know, great metric to, to consider. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's astonishing. And, and, and how have you managed, because I, this is one of the things that fascinates me with we, we two, obviously the, the hell of a journey you've been on from 2012 to, to 2020, seven, seven eight years, um, to, 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 the, to the point where you've now got around 60 academies. Um, how, how have you gone about managing growth because I, 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 I know that you are trying to do that with with uh, with care and responsibility and, 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 and make sure that the capacity within the trust to deliver for those schools that you were sponsoring was always there but that's a lot easier to say than it is to do sure is. How, how have you managed yeah. to, to, to on that journey to to make sure that you had the capacity in your organization to keep on improving those children's lives that you were taking responsibility for? I mean, I, I think at the very start, we got some things right, okay. um, which really helped us to consider growth. So first and foremost, I knew that we wanted to be a national trust. Okay. Uh, some people have ambitions you know, to form a local map that serves local communities. I knew I wanted to do that, but within a larger umbrella of a big map. Okay. So I was always planning for this number of academies. Right. Um, and I think that's important because um, whilst in some respects we did grow organically, um, the plans were always there. Okay. So in terms of what that might look like structurally, what that might look like in terms of the regions that we would work in, the financial implications of that, mm -hmm. and what a, an improvement and a governance model would look like yeah. to work at scale okay. w w was always something that we got right from the start. Right, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I suspect that's not that's reasonably unusual, actually, within, within the large trust. Um, and one of the things that I'd done was to have a look at some of the larger trusts and what they, there weren't that many at that mm, time, mm. but what they were doing well um, and what they weren't doing well. And what wasn't going so well yeah. and, and, and avoid those, those absolutely, mistakes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that, um, looking at that, was very much about growth and okay. you know, how you make that assessment that you do have the capacity to take on you know, more, more schools um, and when you need to pause. And I think one of the things which we've demonstrated quite well over the years is that kind of ability to self-regulate okay. and know when it's a good time to grow okay. and know when you've actually just got to get on with you know, helping improve the schools that you're working okay. with currently. Okay. And have there been natural breaks, sort of consolidation periods as you've grown where you've, as an organisation, you, you've decided, look, actually... We need, we need to just pause, embed, and, and consolidate. Yes, it has. And if you look at the, 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 the growth profile mm. of REACH2, it's probably fairly unique, and I doubt it will be repeated again. Mm -hmm. um, it coincided with a time where there was a lot of ambition from central government yeah. to grow trusts, mm. where, as an organisation, we were ambitious. Mm. Um, and so the, 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 some, some years, you know, we took in 12, 13, 14 academies um, within a year, okay. um, and we haven't really seen the likes of that no. uh, recently. No. Um, so, for example, three years ago, we took in a good number of schools out in East Anglia. Um, all have got significant school improvement challenges, mm -hmm. um, and so we knew that we needed to focus on those um, for a couple of years mm -hmm. rather than grow. Mm -hmm. So we paused our own growth um, with agreement with the Department for Education, and it's only this year that we have agreed with, um, you know, with central government that we'll start to look to grow again. Okay, okay. And I think I'm right. You've also had a fair number of free schools within that, within your family. Indeed, and, you? and again, that was really about what does sustainable growth look like? Okay. Because obviously, it's very different to sponsor an academy that's got lots and lots of challenges um, to opening a a new school. Mm. 
neither are particularly easier or harder than the other. They're just very different. Mm, mm. But what we, um, when we had um, a large number of schools that needed significant school improvement, we um, bid to open 30-plus free schools. Cool. Um, so in some respects, that was a, a, a decision for us that we would do. Um, we'd still open primary academies, but we needed to focus on those schools to improve. But at the same time, we did have the capacity to open new schools, okay. which is why over the next two, three years, we've got a number of free schools still opening. And that, that, that's really interesting. You make, you make the comment that actually one, neither free schools or sponsors are necessarily more difficult than the other they're just they're just different is that is that, is that absolutely your experience? and one of the challenges obviously of a um, of a new school is that a very few people have to do a lot um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. certainly you'll know for example with the new Ofsted framework and the challenges around developing a new curriculum mm -hmm. well if you're in a school of three or four people well you're managing five or six subjects um, and so therefore that's where the the benefits of being of a larger mat can really help bringing that expertise from other schools within you know, within the mat. But so, yes, the challenges are, 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 are equally as, uh, as strong. Mm. Building a school community when you've only got 30 children or 60 children mm. and, and that, you know, significant number of, of, of parents is, is a challenge in its own right. Mm. Um, mm. And I know I visited a school recently that's got 30 children in it um, and it's re working really hard to try and meet the challenges of very few people doing a lot. Really? Yeah. And tell me about the um, the touchstones and the cornerstones. Something that's very, I think, unique to to the Reach Two family. Um, I, I, I did a bit of preparatory reading on this, and, and, and as I understand it, and I hope hope I've got this right, Steve. The the touchstone is about sorry. The cornerstone is about the those things that are absolutely at the core foundation of the trust, whereas your your touchstones are a, a, a set of seven principles that are, as I understood it, very much about the culture you want to see in your diff in your individual academies. Is that is that a fair analysis? It is. Um, when um, I established the trust and started to work with um, our first trustees, mm. um, we really thought very hard about what kind of mat multi academy trust we wanted to be. Um, and you know we come in all shapes and sizes, don't we? And we have different, you know, we have different cultures, different brands, as it were. Um, I was really clear that um, I wanted the schools within the mat to be the focus of all attention. Okay. I wanted them to um, be individual, um, and I wanted them to be what people talked about. Right. So the cornerstone idea is um, the trust itself is. Pretty much as it says, you know, when you have a, a beautiful church or a, a great building, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the cornerstone is that thing that is strong, that's reliable, that's a great foundation, but you don't necessarily see it okay. and you don't necessarily celebrate it. Okay. And for me, that was very much about I want Reach 2 to be that cornerstone, um, which is why we are not a highly branded trust, that we are probably have more autonomy than quite a lot of multi-academy trusts, our schools do. Um, and that we don't really promote ourselves as a trust, we promote our schools. And, I th um, and, and that, that, that's really fascinating because I think the temptation um, for a large multi-academy trust to actually almost do the opposite, to, 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 to make that cornerstone almost dominant mm. in terms of branding, in terms of the scheme of delegation mm. and, and, and the way that autonomy is dealt with within the trust. I think as scale gets larger, the temptation to try and tighten up on and control it must have must be must be there for, for a lot of trust but but it seems to me that reach two has been able to to be be very very clear that they didn't want that to happen yeah i think i think for us it's been a uh, finding a happy balance between those things that have to be consistent yeah you know, there are certain okay. things that all schools need to do mm -hmm. um in a in, in the same way just because it's efficient so mm -hmm. for example how pupils make progress looking at that and you know and and, and so forth mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but actually if you think about some of our schools out in East Anglia, they serve very, very different communities to our schools in Croydon or to our schools in Brighton or our schools into... So um, I don't want them all to be the same, and they need to be different to serve different communities. Um, yeah. And so, therefore, we have battled very hard with central government um, you know, to, to, to make sure that um, we find that balance between consistency um, and, and individuality. And I think we're just about there. You're just about getting it, yeah. getting yeah. it. So if I went into a Reach 2 school, which I've not had the privilege of doing, but if I was to do that, I would see a balance between the individual diversity being recognised of that individual school and its community 
coupled with, on the other hand, the um, some central non-negotiable elements of what it meant to be part of the family of Bridge Two. Yeah, I mean, I think, and you and you referred to the you know to the touchstones, which are are really important to us. Mm. So mm. you're probably aware that a touchstone um, historically was something that was used to measure the quality of gold, mm. Um, mm. and so we've taken that analogy, and it's something that we. Um, that we use to measure the quality of our schools. Mm -hmm. And so with a touchstone, the deeper the mark, the greater the quality. Okay. And so we use our touchstones, which are about you know, the things that, that, that are values, um, to, to, to bring a kind of common identity to our schools. Mm -hmm. So when you go into our schools, you will see the touchstones celebrated, you will see them as part of the school's values, and you will see children, parents, you know, teachers talking about them. Um, so we'd rather be held together by those kind of things mm. rather than something which is perhaps a bit more formal. OK. And how did you arrive at those seven touchstones? Well, I mean, a lot of it was about my values as a, as a, as a leader, as uh -huh. a head teacher, uh -huh. and things that, are, you know, that, we, um, that are, are symptomatic of the, and important to the communities that we work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, inclusion is a massive one for us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Enjoyment is a massive one for us. Leadership. So all the things that over the years as an educationalist have really come to resonate with me are, were the starting points for them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And as, um, as more people have joined the Trust, um, they've contributed to them, and um, all, all of, they're pretty much exactly the same as they were, you know, tw you know all those years ago. Wow, um, so they haven't changed. But um, our schools really, res you know, they, they resonate with our schools. Okay. Um, and um, I, you know, one, one of my um, greatest times of my week is when I see them celebrated on Twitter, or I see people yeah. you know, fulfilling them. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I think the enriched learning experience is another thing that's very, very dear to you and very important within within the trust. Um, Tell me about Try Try Five. It sounds, sounds Which is now eleven for eleven. Oh, is it? Yes, oh, oh, goodness it me! Is. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. So um, we uh, one, one of one of the challenges for our communities is that um, our children don't always have the mm. the kind of experiences that we would want everyone mm. um, to have um, to have access to. Um, and so we think it's our responsibility as a trust um, to provide those opportunities. And we wanted a way again, which we could unite our schools. Um, towards the end of making sure that everyone gets the enrichment um, and the excitement and enjoyment in their learning that they should have. So um, we came up with this idea called 11 Before 11, which is 11 unique experiences you will have um, before you're 11 years old in a Reach 2 school. Okay. Um, and so they are a bit like the touchstones. They're consistent across the whole of, of our schools. Um, and if I share a couple of them, it'll mm. give you a flavour for, of, of what be, we're trying to achieve. Great. So um, one of them, for example, is I will cook a meal for my family with food I've grown myself. OK. So if you think about the impact of that or the implications for that on the school curriculum, mm. etc., mm. and what actually children are learning to, to do, to celebrate, to enjoy, that's really important to us. Um, another one um, is that I will perform in a big national venue. OK. Um, I will visit a, a, a foreign country before I leave school. So all things which we can't guarantee that all our children um, will have access to um, for various reasons, mm. and we make sure they do as a trust. Try five was um, us trying to establish that at scale. Okay. So rather than uh, okay. jump straight to 11, <laughs> we tried the first five, but we did that successfully. Um, and only uh, last week at our head teachers conference, we were celebrating the fact that 100% of our children now are, um, are accessing these 11 before 11, you know, and That's which is quite an incredible achievement. achievement. Yeah. And presumably yeah. that requires an enormous amount of collaboration with, with organisations who can help you fulfil that. Completely, and that's um, you know that's one of the added value that a mat can bring. You know, so um, not all of our children go to France; some go to other countries. But you know, we've been able to work with organisations, you know, in France, and say, right, our kids from Croydon and and Lower Stoff need to come to your chateau in Paris. <laughs> How about it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Brilliant. so um, uh, and, and what we found is that. People are hugely um, willing to help you, will really try to make it happen because it's touched, you know, something in them mm, that realises mm. it's a good thing to be doing for children. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly special. Um, can we talk a bit about the governance structure? Mm. Because it seems to me there's absolutely no way Lee Reach 2 could have been the enormous success it has been without without its governance being of a high quality as well. And I, I know that governance is something that from a very early stage you were very passionate about. Um, so we talked earlier about, about, about the growth strategy, and that's obviously part of governance, but, uh, but I'm more interested in actually the, the, the adaptions you've made along the journey mm -hmm. to 
make sure the governance remains fit mm. for purpose and, and, and effective? Because you've now reached a stage, haven't you, where you've got trust board, and probably the first question to ask is how you have gone about creating a high quality trust board because it's quite a large trust board isn't it about 14, 14 trustees yeah. i think yes um and, and and some very high caliber individuals mm -hmm. uh, around that table has has that been challenging to to get that group of people together or, or, or to to, to, to keep that group of people together over the time? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, one of the very first things um, we did was to actually get the members right. Okay, um, interesting. Of, often people don't focus on members mm -hmm. um, and focus very heavily on the trust board. Um, but for, for me as a head teacher who, know, who knew a lot about school governance but not really a lot about governance of charities or large organisations, I did a lot of research around you know, what effective governance looks like. Mm. Um, and I very much, and we very much see the the, uh, the members as guardians of our constitution. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have got people who are members who were there from day one. Um, and so when we um, established what the purpose of the trust, the mission, the, the vision for the trust is, the same people are still making sure that our trust board and myself are delivering on that. So, so first and foremost, we've got the members right. Right. Um, but yes, indeed, I mean, um, managing a one school or a three school mat compared to managing a 60 school mat is, is very different. And if you think about the numbers um, from when Reach 2 was very small to when it is now, when it was the first school where I was head teacher, we're talking about you know, a, a governing body, we're talking about 100 staff, 800 children, um, uh, and a school budget of about 3 million. Well, now we're talking about 20 odd thousand children, we're talking about a 100 million pound organisation um, and 3,000 employees. Mm. Um, mm. A governing body needs to look different, doesn't it, when you're, <laughs> yeah. when you're yeah. dealing with those um, challenges. Yeah. And one of the things that I realised um, as a head teacher making that shift to a chief exec is that I better get some help with this. Mm. <laughs> and um, the members absolutely knew that they had to appoint trustees who could um, help an organisation who'd got the kind of ambition that we'd got. So we looked far and wide, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we had lots of help in that. Uh, from Academy Ambassadors, mm -hmm. we had help from the Department for Education, um, and our um, our original chair, Peter Little, um, has a background in developing new organisations, new companies, um, understands what that takes, um, and was absolutely crucial and pivotal in you know in um, in in securing that effective trust board. Okay. Um, very much keep ourselves constantly under review. Mm -hmm. So if you if you use the, all those checklists that are out there, we probably tick every one of yeah. them. Okay. Um, but that's that, I, th I think that's a good point, which is actually we build a trust board that is fit for purpose. Yes. Um, and we constantly keep that under review. Yeah. Um, and um, certainly as chief exec, it's something which, um, as a head teacher working with a governing body, it's very different as a, a, as a MAP chief exec working with a trust board who, who know their onions. I'm sure it's very, very different. And, and how, how has your, your personal role, Steve, as a CEO, Evolve, because we all know that obviously being a CEO of a trust is very different from being a head teacher. But actually, it must be right that being a CEO of Reach Two Academy Trust, with its scale, is very different <laughs> to, to to being a CEO of a smaller mat. And, and and you've obviously been on that journey and had to adapt. What what that what's that been like per, from a personal point of view? It's it's been the most challenging thing professionally uh -huh, ever uh -huh. um and there are times where i i literally looked at myself in the mirror and said what are you <laughs> doing <laughs> you're a teacher at heart you're a head teacher what are you doing with this big charity big um big organization um but it's uh, it, it it really was about um, understanding that you need to make that shift and i mm, think mm. where um, we've seen some multi academy trusts um, perhaps um, struggle a bit or, or perhaps not be as effective as we want them to be. I think it's where sometimes the, the, the leader of the organisation has a school background mm. and not realise that actually it's not the same as being an executive head teacher. It's not the same as being a head teacher. It's a completely different job. Mm -hmm. um, and I realised that quite early um, through the guidance of our, the chair of our board. Um, so set about skilling myself up. Okay. Um, the best thing I ever did was to get a, a, a professional coach from outside education. Right. Um, someone who um, runs a very, very large national um, corporation. Um, and um, I basically was a sponge for everything around. So what does growth look like uh -huh. in, a, in a big organisation? What does financial management look like in, a, in, in an organisation? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's very much been about 
understanding this is a different job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Being up for the challenge, because it is a challenge, sure. of, of uh, because I'm an educationist at heart still, um, but, but up for the challenge for learning new skills. Yeah. So now I, I know a lot more about governance, about finance, about other things than I, than I ever did. Yeah, but still enjoy it, I hope. I absolutely love it. Okay. Absolutely love Brilliant. it. Okay, so going back to the governance structure, so you've got the trust board, and we talked a bit about how you, how you built that um, capacity around the trust board uh, table. Um, but one of the really interesting and I think reasonably unique aspects of Reach 2 governance is your is your regional board model. Um, Which now, is changing this year. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So so they as I understand it, they were I'm, I'm assuming created because of the scale of the organization yeah. and, and, yeah. and 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 it became, I assume, quite challenging for the trust board to effectively operate in a, in a sensible dynamic with so many local governing bodies so you you've got an in, inter intervening layer of governance yeah. Yeah. um but how how is how has that worked as the, the the creation because one of the things that struck me is and, and, and i know you're very careful to avoid this but where you are introducing additional layers into governance you've got to be very careful about duplication yeah. Yeah. And, and I know one of the mantras <coughs> of Reach 2 governance is no duplication Absolutely. of governance. Absolutely. Um, but also recruitment, because you've got to recruit not only your members, your trust board, your, your LGB uh, governors, but you've also got to, to populate the people around those regional boards. So I'm just interested in how, how the idea came about in the first place and how you've gone about implementing it. It really came about... Um, as we developed a clear understanding of what we wanted governance to achieve. Okay. Um, and quickly realised that uh, the Trust Board um, obviously could have sufficient oversight, scrutiny, challenge and support of a certain number of schools, a certain number of governing bodies, but there was a limit to mm. do that effectively. Um, we are a trust that is absolutely passionate about governance uh, and one of the very few national mats that still has local governing bodies mm -hmm. at every school um, and that's really important to us. Um, so for us it was about a meaningful number of, uh, of schools, a meaningful number of uh, trustees, non-execs, etc., who could um, who could work effectively with us. So we originally started with four regions, okay. um, and worked on the principle that uh, a, a regional governance um, model um, could work effectively with about twelve to thirteen schools. Um, that as long as there were clear schemes of delegation, clear roles and responsibilities, they could provide an additional layer of of challenge and scrutiny and support to the trust board. Because one of the things that we had um, realised or, or, or we'd really thought very hard about is that when we looked at some of the early larger mats that had had challenges and difficulties, mm. um, they weren't able to answer that question, how well do you know your schools? Mm. And for us, this regional governance level was about a manageable number of schools that people who are taking part in our governance can get to know well. Okay. Um, and that really has worked for us. Um, on that principle, we've moved this year away from four regions to ten clusters. Okay. And so now we're going to have ten cluster boards oh, um, rather than it? four regional boards, okay. um, which is even more governors to yeah, <laughs> and uh, non-execs to, uh, to populate. But again, it's about that, what's a meaningful number? And what we were finding with our regional boards was that as we were getting to 18, 19, 20 schools in a region, mm. then it wasn't as effective as we would like it to okay. be. Okay. And so okay. we've made that move now to 10 cluster boards. For and do the cluster boards cluster operate boards. on the same principle as the regional board? Exactly the same principle. Um, and we're now going through a whole, um, a whole process of recruiting to these cluster boards. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a challenge, as we know, finding volunteers who are skilled in the areas that you need them to be skilled, who can carry out that role voluntarily, mm -hmm. um, is a challenge. Um, but what we have found is that our, um, our raison d'etre, um, the, the um, success of the trust, the values of the trust mm -hmm. absolutely resonate with people. Okay. So we're finding that people are wanting to volunteer and be a part of our governance structure, um, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and how do you, because it strikes me that you want different types of people potentially at the different layers of governance, um, in terms of what they're interested in, what, what the contribution they want to make. So your contribution of a trustee would be very different to the contribution of a, 
a local governing body governor, Absolutely. but equally important yeah. in, in their own yeah. uh, own right. So perhaps one of the things that comes with that structure is it enables you to allocate the right people to the right level of the organisation and then get the very best out of those people. Is that is that your experience? It has worked a little bit like that, yes. I mean, for us, there's a, the, the, the real reason that we still have local governing bodies is that we need to serve the communities in which we're centred. Mm. Um, and quite often, big mats are challenged with that you're centralised, how do you know what's happening in your, in your school communities? Having a, every school having a local governing body means that we are rooted in that community. Mm. And so that role that either a parent governor or a, a volunteer governor on that local governing body makes sure that that community is represented within our governance structure. And that is hugely important to us. Okay. Um, and so at that level, we do want parents who absolutely want to know what the behaviour policy is, absolutely want to know what the curriculum is, absolutely want your school to be a good school or a better school. Um, and I've got a voice in that. So that's really important for us. Um, and yes, you know, we, we find that we've got lots of people volunteering to be at school level. In terms of the, the cluster level, so the mm. more regional level, mm. um, we need the, the kind of um, trustee or governor who can take a bird's eye view over a number of schools, who can have a look at what the challenges are across a number of schools mm. and bring whatever experience they've got to that. Mm. Mm. In refining the work of our cluster boards, for example, we have now developed a new risk management strategy um, across all of our schools okay. and it is at the cluster level the cluster board level where a, a good deal of that scrutiny um, around what you know what risks and what challenges our schools are facing sits okay. um, and that cluster board has the ability to challenge a local governing body and to support a local governing body but also to have a direct conversation with the trust board if they feel that there is something within their region that, that the trustees should be aware of. How does the, work, the dynamic work between the cluster governing... Uh, do you call, call them cluster governing cluster bodies? Boards. Cluster, cluster boards. boards. Cluster yeah. board and the trust board. So is there any commonality of personnel between those two layers? No. No, um, OK. The, it's obviously open and clear communication is mm. crucial. And one of the things that our trust board has absolutely got right... Um, is the kind of the working practices of each of the boards. Mm -hmm. So if you are on a cluster board, a regional board, you can pick up the phone to one of the chair of the trust board committees at any time. Right. Okay. So we haven't. W there are formal reporting procedures, and, sure. when we, and when we have a cluster board meeting, there'll be an item around what things need to be escalated to the trust board, what needs to be fed back to local governing bodies, and vice mm. versa. Mm. But the the working practice and the culture that we've established that is, if you're on a cluster board and that you feel there is something mm. which the trust board needs to know, then pick up the phone. Okay, and, and, and I welcome that. Absolutely, no, I can, I can, I can well imagine. So, how would how would a, a typical meeting of a cluster board work? Would would it? And, and the point I'm getting at, Steve, is is, is it is it in a sense a federated governing body model, or is is it a, a model that actually creates capacity that cannot possibly exist at the trust board level? Um, and you talked earlier about the, the, the trust getting to the side where. Mm -hmm. The sheer number of schools meant that the trust board couldn't possibly, on its own, remain scrutinising those uh, all of those schools. So, if it would would a meeting, for example, on school performance aspects, work sequentially through all of the schools within that cluster, and then would there be some elements of sort of common analysis or common discussion rather than sequential analysis? Yes, I mean, um, if, if we look at kind of the linear model, then obviously each of our individual governing bodies um, is, is, is talking about the things that it needs to talk about mm. um, and it is escalating the things that it think it needs more support or challenge with to the, to the cluster board. It's the cluster board's job to synthesise that, okay. to really, and what our new risk strategy is doing is saying, where does that cluster board really need to focus its efforts? Mm. Um, and it's it's not just going through every single school um, and you know ticking okay. the box okay. saying okay, okay yeah. we've done that. No, no, it very much is about prioritisation. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, a good example is as I was developing the new risk strategy across um, all our uh, local governing bodies and our regional um, boards. It, well, that half a dozen people have got a background in risk management, right. you know, and so they're advising me on on what our strategy should look like. Um, but more to the point, they're sat on a cluster regional board using that expertise mm. to make sure that that particular strategy for us is working. Okay. So that's absolutely additional capacity that we wouldn't have ordinarily. Sure. So, and I like that word that, that you, you talked about synthesising the 
the, uh, the, the analysis that takes place at the, at the, at the cluster board. And because it seemed to me that when, you're, when you've got the benefit of bringing a number of um, people together to look at the performance of a number of academies, almost, dare I say it, in a mini-mat model, one of the things that comes is that you're able to identify high-level themes that are running through the yeah. trust or running through the cluster. And, and, and you can operate, therefore, not only at that granular level, but also look at themes, risk perhaps being one of them, that can be addressed more globally. Yeah, I mean, a good example, for example, out in East Anglia, is the, 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 the regional board has been flagging up massive recruitment issues in this region okay. where they're perhaps not doing somewhere up in the in the West Midlands. Okay. You know, and I think that's a great example of where governance mm. can be effective mm. because there, there is an issue specific to a particular region of the country that is not affecting us elsewhere. Mm. But, of course, the Trust Board now are fully aware that out in that region we've got an issue around recruitment, okay. etc. That, and really I think that's a really good example of how governance can be effective. Yeah. No, that's a great... Uh, that's a really interesting example. And, and you talked about the importance of local governing bodies, um, uh, and, and you're right that, that, that a number of the larger maps have either changed the role of local governance, renamed the role of local governance, and, you, and it seems to me at week two you've stayed very true to, one, the concept of a local governing body, and you've stuck with that language, but also made sure that the role of the people around the LGB table is a meaningful one that makes a contribution. Um, to what extent are they involved in school performance issues as opposed to community representation perspectives? Or, or, or do you expect both from your local governors? You know, we, we expect both. Um, so we have a, we have a, a, a common agenda that our uh, local governing bodies will look at. And, of course, school performance will be um, part of that. Mm -hmm. But there are eight areas in which we ask all our governing bodies to look at. So okay. school performance is one of them. Safeguarding and well-being of pupils and staff is another one of them. Um, health and safety is another one of them. Financial well-being of the school is another one of them. Um, and, and also, you know, there, there are eight of them. So it really is about um, just as the trust board has got a broad set of skills that's needed, so is a local governing body. Um, and what we're finding is that um, having the new risk strategy has given it brought a real focus to what our local governing bodies okay. are talking about. So there are no there are eight, eight areas that they're going to you know, that they're going to be talking about at each meeting. Okay. Um, some of them less than others. So we're not just going through the motions of you know if your safeguarding is strong and your well-being is good, then you don't need to spend as much time on that. But except to celebrate it. But actually, if you've got challenges around school performance, then let's spend our time talking yeah. about that. So spend your time proportionately. Absolutely. That, 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 that's really, really fascinating. And probably the final thing I wanted to just touch on, Steve, if I may, is, is uh, the, one of the, I think, really interesting things about Week 2 is the fact that you have actually created a sister trust down in the, down in the southwest, Week South Academy Trust, uh, which I think runs to around 12, 13 academies does, now. Yeah. So, so not, as, not as big as, uh, as, as nope. Week 2 yet, yet yeah. but, 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 <laughs> but nonetheless of a sizable capacity already. And where did the idea c c come from? From to to well, not only to move into a, a region that, that which two wasn't wasn't part of, um, but to create a sister trust that would bear the name Reach that would mm. presumably have some commonality of values and vision. Mm. Um, it's, it's, and, and I guess you know, when, when you, it seems to me you would have had quite a lot on your plate without taking on sister trust as well. So what was the story behind that? Um, really about a considered um, decision that it wasn't right for Reach 2 to go um, you know, much further than, 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 than we currently are, um, but that our ambition was, was equally as strong to help other parts of the country. Okay. Um, and we've learned so much um, as a mat, you know, one of those mats that's come from one school to 60 and, and everything that we've learned in that. Um, so we had uh, the idea that actually... Um, in, in terms of managing the risk of growth, well, why not just set up another organisation that does it for you okay. and with you? Okay. Um, and that's very much what Reach South was about. There, um, you know, Dean Ashton, who worked with me in the very early days of Reach 2, is the chief executive of Reach mm. South. We've got some common members 
um, um, right. and because um, I'm a member, for example, of Bridge South. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, so that um, common DNA, that what's the vision, the values, the protection of the constitution mm. is there, mm. um, but just in a different way. Okay. Um, and what um, Reach South have been able to do is to take what we've learned about governance, take what we've learned about school improvement, managing growth, uh, and use it there. And I think it's a way of, of, of ensuring that we do more of what we want to do um, in, a, in, in a robust and challenging way. It protects Reach 2, um, and it allows Reach South to, you know, to, to develop its own identity as well. And has Reach South focused solely on, solely on primaries? Or? No, that's a very good question. Ah, right. Because um, over the years, we've had challenges to move away from being just a primary mat, yeah. um, to go into maybe special schools and secondary schools. Ah. Um, and we have and we will continue to resist that, okay. um, that temptation. Um, but actually, Reach South does do um, secondary schools, it does primary schools, and it's got a very good special school as well. Okay. Um, right. And so it was a way of broadening what we do, um, but with a different organisation. Okay, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. They're all told, 73-odd academies that, you know, benefiting from the, the original vision that you developed all the way back in 2012. Steve, that's been absolutely great. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your your story and, your, and, and the insights that, uh, that you've learned along the way with Reach 2. That was uh, really, really interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. We hope you enjoyed this Ed Influence podcast from Brown Jacobson. For more podcasts like this one, be sure to subscribe or visit brownjacobson.com forward slash Ed Influence to access all our previous episodes. If you have any questions about the subjects covered in this podcast or any other issues, you can reach us at education at brownjacobson.com. You can also search for us on LinkedIn and Twitter to find the most up-to-the-minute news from our leading team.